Friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I want to welcome you to our online service of worship for Riverside United Church in London, Ontario. My name is Dave Exley. I'm the lead minister for Riverside, and uh, we hope that you feel a sense of God's presence uh, in the music that's shared throughout this service, in the words that are spoken, uh, in the images that you see. We know it's not an easy time when it comes to uh, our faith tradition. We're so used to gathering together, but even in the absence of that, there are so many ways that we can connect with one another. I'll have some uh, information to share with you that will be specific to many of you who are part of the Riverside Community of Faith, uh, but we'll save that for the end of our service. Uh, but as we move into this time, just before we begin our service of worship, once again, I want to remind you that, uh, that now more than ever, in the absence of being able to pass uh, the plate uh, for our offering time at each of our worship services that we typically have, um, we find it challenging, uh, as many other communities of faith do as well. And so we want to encourage you uh, to go online. Uh, you can go to our website, riverside.on.ca. Uh, hit the Give Online button, and that will navigate you through the process of, of giving, whether it be through debit, through uh, a credit card. There are a number of different ways that, that you can give, and you can give repeatedly that way. You can also contact uh, Jan at the church office, and she'll guide you through some alternative ways to give, and she can even give you some information on our pre-authorized remittance program that will take out monthly donations for our ministry. Um, contact her at jan at riverside.on.ca. But as we are gathered in our various different places uh, throughout the city and no doubt around the world. Let us celebrate what it means to be God's people together, singing songs of faith and hearing that voice of love that God speaks to us this day and every day. Let us worship God together.
Our scripture reading for today comes from John's Gospel, and I'm thankful for uh, Tanner Morris Marlad, who's one of our confirmands who will be doing the reading for us this morning. And so let us listen for that divine voice that comes to us from these words of Holy Scripture. 
The Gospel reading for this morning is from John chapter 10. Jesus said, I assure you that whoever doesn't enter the sheep pen through the gate, but climbs over the wall, is a thief and an, out and an outlaw. The one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The guard at the gate opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. Whenever he has gathered all of his sheep, he goes before them, and they follow him, because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger, but will run away, because they don't know the stranger's voice. Those who heard Jesus use this analogy didn't understand what he was saying. So Jesus spoke again, I assure you that I am the gate of the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and outlaws, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come and go and out and find pasture. The thief enters only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came so that they could have life, indeed, so that they could live life to the fullest. May the Spirit bless us with wisdom and wonder as we ponder the meaning of these words for our lives. Friends, let us pray. O oh, creative God, source of all beauty, you give light to the soul. Open our hearts as we listen for your word. Open our minds as we dream with you. Reveal your life-giving truth that comforts and disturbs us through Jesus, the risen Christ. Amen. Well, one of the last things we did as a, a family before the stay-at-home order was issued here in London was to, to go to an escape room together. Betsy and I had done a few of these, but we had never done this with, uh, with the girls. If you've not had a chance to experience this fairly new cultural ph phenomenon, I'll, I'll give you just a, a brief overview. The idea is that your, your group has a mission, uh, and you work together using the clues in the room to, to navigate through all the challenges that will eventually enable you to escape that room or rooms, depending on the situation, in the allotted time provided for your group, usually about an hour or so. Each room is rated for difficulty, and there's always a creative backstory. Now, the room that we chose was a 9 out of 10 difficulty. And the story took us to the year 1944, to the height of World War II. We were on board the Steel Shark, a U.S. Navy submarine deep in the North Atlantic Ocean. The story was we were on a vitally important mission to spy on a German battle cruiser. But during the mission, uh, as it was going smoothly, without warning, the submarine plunges into the sea, the engines die, and the pressure in the cabin begins to increase, and the hull is cracking under the immense pressure of the seabed. And without power, only 60 minutes of reserve oxygen remain, and thus began our mission. Now, unfortunately, we failed to achieve our mission. We didn't escape the room in the allotted time. But if we just had a few more minutes, we would have done it. Uh, but alas, we found ourselves on the losing side of the ledger for th that particular room challenge. You know, I was thinking in that moment that, that life can often mirror the experience of an escape room. Obstacles are placed in our way that, that we need to overcome. And the clock just seems to keep ticking and ticking and ticking to the point that we can't even really think about anything else but that. And of course, in life, there are winners and losers. For some people of faith, following in the way of Jesus is like navigating through an escape room. If we listen closely to the words of Scripture, God will unlock the doors to us. If we, they think, pray the sinner's prayer with all the right words and with an honest heart, and the gift of heaven will suddenly become available to us, those doors unlocked to us. There are problems with that kind of thinking. For like the escape room experience, some will manage to unlock the door while others will fail. And so when we hear the words spoken by Jesus in John's gospel, those words where he says, I assure you that whoever doesn't enter in through the sheep pen, through the gate, is a thief and an outlaw. When we hear those words, we can't help but think that the gift of God is limited to those that find that Jesus gate and enter through it the right way. I can hear 
television evangelists and street preachers speaking these words of Jesus as a threat, warning us that unless we say the name of Jesus and, and bow before him, then eternal damnation will be waiting for us behind door number two, a door that may open a little bit more like a trap door beneath us. When Jesus says, I am the gate, so many people wrongly interpret this as, well, Jesus is the password, or, or he's the one that stands at the gate with a, with a challenge for us, and we won't be welcomed into God's realm if we fail the test. I suppose that, that people living in Jesus' time had surrendered to this kind of living, this kind of reality. A hierarchical world where, where some are welcomed through the gate, while others find themselves stuck on the other side, begging for mercy and fighting for their life. The story that leads into this one is an important one to pay attention to, to put this one in context. Uh, for in John chapter 9, we hear the story of the blind man who Jesus heals and then instructs to go and wash in the pools of Siloam. If you remember that passage, you'll recall that there was a great deal of back and forth discussions between Jesus, arguments between him and the religious authorities. This man's condition prompted those in his world to create fences, barriers, to keep him from experiencing the grace, mercy, and love that God so longs for us to experience. But what does Jesus do? He opens the gate to him doesn't require anything of him, doesn't give him a task. In fact, he even tells his disciples that neither the blind man nor his parents sinned, causing this to happen, causing him to find himself on the wrong side of the gate. Jesus sees this man, his need, and gathers up mud from the ground and, and heals him. He opens the gates of mercy and love to him in that moment. Our world is really no different than the one that Jesus encountered in his life and the blind man finds himself in. Despite all the gains that we've made in society, there are still people building walls, creating conditions so that 90% of the world's population has to navigate through some sort of escape room type scenario that often is a 10 out of 10 for difficulty. Well, the 10% of the world, they're given a head start, given all the answers. Many of us find ourselves in that place. For we live in a world of many gatekeepers, those that get in the way of people experiencing the fullness of all of life and all its joy. In doing so, we create our own versions of heaven and hell, ones that are not simply reserved for the life that awaits us beyond this one, but ones that are experienced here on earth. Things like fear and greed anxiety about scarce resources, those are the things that often prompt us to uphold this world that we live in, this world of walls and gates. I love what Kabir, the 15th century Indian mystic poet and saint, once had to say about some of the doctrine that you'll find in our church tradition. He once wrote, I sat one day with a priest who expounded on the doctrine of hell I listened to him for hours, and then he asked me what I thought of all he said. And I replied, that doctrine seems an inhumane cage. No wonder all the smart dogs ran off. <laughs> when some look at this passage from John's Gospel, they inadvertently begin to construct walls and cages that, that God, and nor Jesus, intended to build. For listen to what Jesus says at the end of this reading that we heard today. Jesus says in verse 10, I came so that they could have life. Indeed, so that they could live life to the fullest. God's realm of, of grace, mercy, and love, the world of abundance that God dreams of, it is not placed on the other side of an escape room challenge. Jesus isn't some bouncer at an exclusive nightclub that, that stands in the way of us entering that blessed place of, of peace and joy, that party that God has in store for us. Jesus is not the kind of gate that you think he is. 
If you look closely at this passage and, and study the roots of the, the images that Jesus, is, Jesus uses to explain his role in God's dream for the world, you'll, you'll find that Christ's placement may surprise you. In the very next verse, just beyond this reading, in verse 11 uh, from chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd always lays down his life for the sheep. Now, scholars suggest that, that Jesus was leaning on uh, some first century imagery in this passage. For at this time, it was common for Palestinian shepherds to, to sleep at night across the entrance to the sheepfolds, providing security for the sheep within. In other words, Christ is, is not the gate that stands between us and God. Christ is the gate that longs to keep us in the presence of God, where we already are. The one that longs to keep the voices of, of hate, division, and judgment out of God's field of joy. We're already in the pasture of God's grace and love. Jesus just simply longs to keep us safe and, and in the fold, in that place of love. God's not concerned with just one of us. God is concerned with what makes us one, what keeps us together as creation. The gate of God's love is not what we think it is. It's not designed to separate sacred from secular or blessed from not blessed or, or, or worthy of love and unworthy of love. The world of John's gospel is a strange one indeed, and we struggle many times with it. I love what Will Willimon once said about this. He said, I've been spending time, a lot of time, in John's gospel, so much so that it may look like I'm on drugs. <laughs> in fact, one of his students said uh, that John's gospel is like the gospel of Matthew on LSD. <laughs> John's gospel is concerned with, with the now. It's concerned with, with these magical things. And, and when Jesus shows up, We've got things like water turning into wine. Weird stuff begins to happen. You're excited, you're confused, but all the while you're in God's hands. Our mind needs to shift if we're going to see through the lens of Jesus, if we're going to understand what the gospel writer is trying to say. But the key is this. Jesus said, I came so that they could have life. Indeed, so that they could live life to the fullest. I imagine that the they to which Jesus is referring to is all those who in his world found themselves on the other side of the gates that the world had created. All those who had experienced judgment and hatred. All those who longed for healing, longed to be in the presence of God, but for whatever reason the world had found excuses to stand in the way of that taking place. We're children, as people of faith, we're children of the already but not yet. We're already in that realm where Christ lays at the gate, in the pres keeping us in the presence of God, but we also live in the world of not yet, where people, perhaps even ourselves, are trapped in a world that looks like an escape room, where the odds have been stacked against individuals within this world. We're starting to see in this world that we're living in now what it means to be in this together. But we're not there yet. This is a wounded and fragile world, and it's revealing to us uh, the need to navigate away from this persistent world of not yet and open the door to the fullness of God's grace, mercy, and love, to that abundant life that all should experience. We need to rest in the knowledge that all we need to do as people of faith is to remember. Remember who we are and whose we are. Remember those words of Jesus, that I came so that they, that all might have life, that indeed that all might live life to the fullest. That world is already available. All we need to do is open our eyes and our ears to one another and celebrate what it means to be God's people. Thanks be to God. Amen. We now move into a, a time of prayer. And for our prayer today, we have something a little different for you. I found this timely meditation piece on the work of the people.com, a favorite website of mine. Uh, this particular piece is called Praise Song for the Pandemic. It is a, a timely prayer, a timely video. 
And so let this, as we listen to these words and receive these images, let this be our prayer and let us join our hearts with God and with all creation as we pray together. Let us pray. Praise be the nurses and doctors, every medical staff bent over flesh to offer care, for lives saved and lives lost, for showing up either way. Praise for the farmers tilling soil, planting seeds so food can grow, an act of hope if ever there was. Praise be the janitors and garbage collectors, the grocery store clerks and the truck drivers barreling through long, quiet nights. Give thanks for bus drivers, delivery persons, postal workers, and all those keeping an eye on water, gas, and electricity. Blessings on our leaders making hard choices for the common good, offering words of assurance. Celebrate the scientists working a way to understand the thing that plagues us to find an antidote, and all the medicine makers. Praise be the journalists keeping us informed. Praise be the teachers, finding new ways to educate children from afar, and blessings on parents holding it together for them. Blessed are the elderly and those with weakened immune systems, all those who worry for their health. Praise for those who stay at home to protect them. Blessed are the domestic violence victims on lockdown with abusers, the homeless, and refugees. Praise for the artists and poets, the singers and storytellers, all those who nourish with words and sound and color. Blessed are the ministers and therapists of every kind, bringing words of comfort. Blessed are the ones whose jobs are lost, who have no savings, who feel fear of the unknown gnawing. Blessed are those in grief, especially who mourn alone. Blessed are those who have passed into the great night. Praise for police and firefighters, paramedics, and all who work to keep us safe. Praise for all the workers and caregivers of every kind. Praise for the sound of notifications, messages from friends reaching across the distance. Give thanks for laughter and kindness. Praise be our four-footed companions with no forethought or anxiety, responding only in love. Praise for the seas and rivers, forests and stones who teach us to endure. Give thanks for your ancestors, for the wars and plagues they endured and survived. Their resilience is in your bones and your blood. Blessed is the water that flows over our hands and the soap that helps keep them clean each time a baptism. Praise every moment of stillness and silence so new voices can be heard. Praise the chance at slowness. Praise be the birds who continue to sing the sky awake each day. Praise for the primrose poking yellow petals from dark earth. Blessed is the air clearing overhead so one day we can breathe deeply again. And when this has passed, may we say that love spread more quickly than any virus ever could. May we say this was not just an ending, but also a place to begin.
As we close our service today, may you hear God's voice of love speaking to you this day, giving you comfort. May you be reminded that even in the midst of all of this, God wants to see us through. God will lead us and guide us in the days ahead. Go with the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Be blessed, my friends. Stay in peace. Amen. When you go from this place, be true. May the blessing of life find you. May the winds of the Spirit guide you across the ocean of all your days. May the seeds of your love, your life, adorn the way when you go from this place be true may the blessing of life find you may the winds of the spirit guide you across the ocean of all your days May the seeds of your love, your life, adorn the way, adorn the way. Just a, a few announcements to, to share, most specifically for folks who are members and, and a part of our wider community of uh, Riverside. Uh, today, if you're catching this on, on Sunday morning, May 3rd, there's an opportunity uh, to join us for a, a, a vir virtual coffee hour via Zoom. If you subscribe to our e-newsletter, uh, information was sent out. You can go into your email and, and check for all the information on how to access that. Uh, if you're interested, and you catch this in time, uh, you can also send me an email, dave at riverside.on.ca, and I'll be sure to respond with all the information that uh, you need for that. Uh, 
those of you who are a part of our community of faith know that, uh, that I have uh, returned from a, a time of medical leave. It's been a challenge returning in the midst of this uh, stay-at-home order, this quarantine uh, time, as we're separate from one another. But I'll be moving back toward uh, full time as the month progresses. Uh, May 18th is uh, the date that has been uh, set where I'll be able to, to ramp up a little bit more what I'm able to do. But I want to thank you for your patience as I mark my graduated return to this uh, community of faith not an easy time to return. And I wanna to speak to all of you who have experienced and are experiencing depression and anxiety to let you know uh, that you are not alone. Those words that come from our United Church Creed uh, are important words for us to hear. They're words that God speaks to us and that hopefully we as a church can speak to each and every person who is a part of our community of faith and even those that are strangers to us. You are not alone. Be blessed, my friends. Uh, if you want to uh, know more about us, uh, you can subscribe to our newsletter. Go to our website, and at the very bottom of that main page, you can enter your email address in there. You can also subscribe to this channel uh, and make sure that, uh, that you get alerts on upcoming videos. We've got some midweek uh, music videos. I'm thankful for the laid laws that have already provided us with a, a special music uh, thing. We've got other members that are going to be providing that as well. So we look forward to that happening midweek. And if you've subscribed to our channel, you'll get alerts uh, as well. I want to thank you for supporting our ministry. You can give a thumbs up to this, uh, this video if you enjoyed this, but we hope you have felt a sense of God's presence with you here in this online worship service. Go now in peace, my friends. Thank you.